a charge to keep, I have. A God to glorify, a charge to never dying soul to save and fit it for the sky
In the tradition of our African ancestors, I asked permission to do this libation service. Permission granted. I would ask you to respond, Ashe, at the appropriate moments. We honor our ancestors whose lives call us forward to become who we are. We remember the cloud of witnesses to the faithful of the past and of the ages to come. Saints and sinners alike who nurtured and challenged us, the ancestors we claim and the ones we don't. The ancients we know by name and the names lost to history. We honor our ancestors whose voices are in our throats. We honor the greatest of our ancestors, the firstborn of many dead, our eldest brother, Jesus. Ashe. Amen. Will you please join me with the invocation? Please read it as follows. Our God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. Meet us in this moment of promises and possibilities. Breathe your spirit on us and into us now, that we may live into the joy of the call you make today and always. Amen. Let's sing this together, amen? Sing time. Come on. Hold to this hand. God's unchanging hand. Hold to God's hand. Hold to God's hand. God's unchanging hand. Oh, build your hopes on things eternal. Oh, to God's unchanging hand. Covet not this world's vain riches. Covet not this world's vain riches that so rapidly decay. That so rapidly decay. Oh, seek to gain. Seek to gain the heavenly treasure. They will never pass away. They will never pass away. Come on, let's sing it together. Hold to God's hand. Changing hand, hold oh, 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 to God's hand. God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Oh, 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 oh to God's unchanging hand. For although 
those who've come before when your journey is completed if to god you have been true if to god you have been true fair and bright the home in glory fair Let's do this together. Come on, sing. Hold. Hold to God's hand. God's unchanging hand. Oh, hold to God's hand. God's unchanging hand. Oh, be it your hopes on things eternal. Oh, oh, oh to God's unchanging hand. Come on, let's sing it together. Hold to God's hand, God's unchanging hand. Oh, hold to God's hand, God's unchanging hand. Oh, be it your awesome things eternal. Oh, hold to God's unchanging hand. Let's sing that one more time. Come on. Oh, oh, oh to God's hand. God's unchanging hand. Oh, 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 oh. Methodist Theological School in Ohio to welcome you to this place, to this time. We gather as people from a long ways away and close at home. We gather as people who have connected with this community in so many ways for so very long. We gather as those who are here for the first time, but we gather. We gather because we are about the business of installing a dean today. And we're about more than that. We're about worship. And we are about proclaiming the mission we share together a mission of seeking justice for a world so desperately in need. We have our aspirations in this place too. And today it feels like we're drawn just a little closer to where it is we've said for so long we want to go. We are about installing a dean but in reality, we are about recognize and affirming relationships. We have come to see this place as a place of connection, a hub of relationship. And I can think of no one who embodies that more than Dr. Valerie Bridgman. So this is something we do here in this place. But it's something we do for the world around us and far from here.
About five years ago, Dr. Bridgman came here. We tried to get her to come a long time before that, but there's not enough time to talk about my anguish <laughs> in rejection. But about five years ago, in this room, I had the opportunity to introduce Dr. Bridgman for the first time. And I said something to the effect that she is exactly the disruption we need. <laughs> and that's exactly what we got. We have not been disappointed. You push us, and you prod us, and you call us, and you love us. We all need some disruption. Things aren't the way they should be. And I think there's something stirring in me that wasn't stirring before, and I suspect in some others. But it hasn't been just disruption. You have been a balm. And, and while disruptive, you have provided a kind of adhesion, not the kind that glosses over anything. You don't make it that easy. You are a person, you are a pastor, you are a scholar, you are a leader that will continue to call us to be what we can be here. And we're so very grateful. In these times that we so often find ourselves shredding through dark nights, reminding ourselves of the words of the Old Negro spiritual, treading our path through the blood of the slaughter, it is so good, it is so good to be able to see a light lifted up, a light lifted up high so that those of us who are so in need of refreshment can come and can celebrate that God has done something good, Amen. that God has done something magnificent. I consider it and will always consider it one of the great honors of my presidency of both the Chicago Theological Seminary and the Society for the Study of Black Religion to come and bring greetings to not simply a friend, but a sister who lives in my heart. There are not many things I will do as president of either organization that bring me so much joy. So I thank the Lord for what we are celebrating today. I thank God that here in the middle of Ohio, a light has been lifted up unto the nations to remind us that indeed hope still lives and to remind us that there is still work for us to do together. On behalf of the Chicago Theological Seminary, I bring you greetings and I offer you our continued support. And on behalf of the Society for the Study of Black Religion, I say unto you, Valerie Bridgman, you are our dream come true. Good morning. My soul is Holy Ghost happy this morning. It gives me so much pleasure and joy to come here on behalf of the National Council of Churches. 38 communion, Protestant communions ranging from Orthodox, traditional African American, uh, historically uh, white uh, Protestant denominations and peace churches. 38 communions. And in that 38 communions, the health of the church is dependent upon the education on academic institutions. So we're excited about 
uh, bringing greetings and welcoming my dear sister as the dean here. I've had the pleasure of calling her dean already because she was the dean of our seminarians track just two weeks ago at the Christian Unity Gathering. And she brought us to a whole nother level. Dr. Bridgman, you are a combination of church, academy, and prophetic spaces that is only you. You bring something that no one brings in this work. And I praise and thank God that you are here and you are doing this work. And I feel particularly blessed that I'm allowed to be part of this journey with you. So God be praised. And I want to thank MTSO for listening to God. And as she continues to do, as um, Congressman John Lewis says, get in good trouble, <laughs> then you all will trust God and wade in the waters with her. And we will also be with you. And I look forward to our continued partnership and friendship. We got you. <laughs> To President Rundle and distinguished faculty and family and friends of Dr. Bridgman, I bring you greetings on behalf of the Forum for Theological Exploration. On behalf of our President Stephen Lewis, we send our words of congratulations to you, Dr. Bridgman. I love this dear sister. I met her years ago at Proctor. And when I met her, she was just what you consider good folk. Uh, I always talked about our distinctions and always didn't, didn't see myself as on par with her and she reminded me that she saw me as a colleague. I'm so deeply grateful for your work, not only as a scholar in the work that we are called to do with scholars of color, but also as a mentor and a leader and a sage and a prophet and a mother, medicine woman, all of those things and so much more. And I remember when we talked about the coming of this occasion, and it just reminded me that there are times that we are awakening to our own sense of call as individuals, but there are times when the community insists that we awaken to the call of specific communities. And here you are, sister, right where you belong. And to all those who are to come, the next generation of scholars, pastoral leaders, womanists, they are made that much more better as a result of your witness. So congratulations. I love you, and I look forward to the great work that you will do, not only here, but in the many places that you enter. God bless you. Hello. Hello. So I wrote this poem, and these are my words, but I bet that I'm speaking for, for some of you. Dr. Valerie Bridgman, yours is the voice that smooths and wraps its wisdom round my thumping heart when I have no words to say. Your listen is the quiet that holds me up when I could walk into the ocean and never return to shore. You human me when I am afraid of my reflection in the mirror. Who is that woman with what used to be my face? I remember those hands, those knees that used to bend and reach so free. You blood me. You flesh me. You give me my remember when I want to run away. You bring me my toes, my legs. Those are my thighs, my breasts and chin. You body me back again. You wing me. You wind me. You song my skin together. 
I am breath because of you. I am blink and tongue. See these arms and veins. You pray and poem. And now I am lungs and bones because you believed. Amen. Thank you. In 2 Kings 22, verses 14 through 20, we find these words. So the priest Hilkiah, Ahikam, Akbar, Shaphan, Isaiah, went to the prophetess Huldah, the, son, the wife of Shalem, son of Tikvan, son of harvest, keeper of the wardrobe. She resided in Jerusalem with the second quarter where they consulted her. She declared to them, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, tell the man who sent you to me, thus says the Lord, I will indeed bring disaster on this place and on its inhabitants. All the words of the book that the king of Judah has read, because they have abandoned me and have made offerings to other gods so that they have provoked me to anger with all of the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be kindled against them in this place and it will not be quenched. But as to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words that you have heard, because your heart was penitent and you humbled yourself before the Lord. When you heard how I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a dissolution and a curse. And because you have torn your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you, says the Lord. Therefore, I will gather you to your ancestors and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace. Your eyes shall not see all the disaster that I will bring to this place. They took the message back to the king. This is the word of God for the people of God. Great is 
thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Now morning by morning, new mercies I see. about the faithfulness of God if you are on speaking terms with the faithfulness of God won't you put your hands together again one more time if it had not been for the Lord 
come on, let all MTSU say, if it had not been for the Lord, who was on our side. Tell me, where would we be? What a beautiful celebration. What a beautiful occasion. What a wonderful moment to be here at this place and to celebrate our girlfriend, yeah. our sister beloved, our warrior, our prophet, my God, our preacher, and our sage. It is, I share with others in saying I would not want to be anywhere else but where I am uh, this morning. In fact, it is, this is a cool drink of water. <laughs> Amen. It is a cool drink of water in a barren era and a dry era. I feel like going on. I, want, I count it an honor and a privilege to be asked to speak at the Methodist School of Theology on this very special occasion of my friend and my colleague, the Reverend Dr. Valerie Bridgman as your Dean and Vice President of Academic Affairs. And I want to thank President J. Rundle Rond for this invitation and for the resources that he and this committee and this community have put into making this special moment so very unusual, very different, eyes have never seen and ears have not heard, but this is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our sight. So I thank President Rondole for the invitation and I greet the faculty, my colleagues in the faculty, administration, staff, and student body, and friends of the seminary for acknowledging this as a special occasion. But not just for Dr. Bridgman, but for the life and the legacy of this school. It is the installation of Dr. Valerie, but it is the transformation of Methodist Theological School. Dean installations are not typically grand ceremonies. In fact, I don't think I've ever been to something like this before. Deans come and go. They come on the scene and they move off the scene. They just go into their office and die. But you have made this a big fanfare. And guess what? It is a big deal. And I thank the school for acknowledging that it is a big deal. It is a cause for celebration. Congratulate you on recognizing the gifts of this scholar and professor and writer, and that you were smart and lucky enough to snatch her when she became available and convincing her to become a member first of your faculty and then being astute enough to tap her once you saw what we have always seen, Amen. that she is a leader, a sage, a, a medicine woman, if you will, a tremendous administrator. And we're glad to see that you know what we have always known. Tapping Dr. Valerie to serve as your Dean and Vice President of Academic Affairs, you are to be saluted. And you can see that we are here because we love her. And as my daddy would say, we came in 10 on a mule. <laughs> That, now that's, a, that's a very old Southern expression. But we came 10 on a mule. And I'm sure this, 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 this place has never seen so many of us here. But we have come to bear witness, 
to declare our support and love for Valerie and to let you know, don't you mess with her. Her people are here because, because that's what we do. We come see about our children. And we want you to know that she comes from people. She is here with her sister uh, here in the city, but she also comes from a larger tribe of us uh, who are so proud of her and so, so proud of this institution for making this historic choice of Dr. Valerie. Now listen, I don't know if MTSU was prepared to hire a black woman Bible scholar at the time, but I want you to know that 30 years ago, I, am, I, I come here with my own share of memories and a connection to this school. And I am especially pleased to be here because this is not the first time that the school, but in fact, 30 years ago, the school showed respect for black women's leadership. 30 years ago, with my qualifying uh, exams behind me and officially ABD and broke, <laughs> And testing the job waters, I interviewed and received my first job offer, which was from Methodist Theological School of Ohio. I believe it was called Methesco. I believe we called it Methesco then. I don't know if anyone is still here from that period, but I do remember a great visit, a sincere president, and a respectable offer. I ended up working somewhere else but MTSU has always held a special place in my heart. And when Dr. Valerie shared with me that she was thinking of coming, I said to her, it's a good place. And I don't know if MTSU was prepared to hire me back then or even Valerie five years ago, but MTSU thought it was, and they have been willing to take the risk. But I doubt either of us any of us knew what is involved in hiring black women scholars. People of color, racial, ethnic minorities, but black women scholars in particular. I didn't know what it meant to be hired. And the institution I ended up going to did not understand what it meant to hire me any more than I think that the school here today really knows. I think you have an idea. But, <laughs> I, I, but I don't think you really know what it means to bring those who have been to the margin right. now to the center. The school was clueless, whether that is MTSU or that is Vanderbilt University, where I ended up going. Clueless what it meant to hire racial ethnic minorities, a black faculty, a black woman. But not just what it means for the hiree, but also what it means for those who hire us. The pain, the discomfort, the pressure on an institution to see itself through the eyes of those who have been watching. Wow. What it means for an institution to see itself from the, from the eyes of those who have been in the slave quarters and have now been brought to the big house and not just to serve in the kitchen, but at to sit at the table. And that is quite a, I, I, I'm sitting here and I'm saying to myself with all, with all love that I can muster, what it must mean for those who are white in the audience to experience this moment. What it must mean to feel like perhaps your school is changing without your permission. This is not quite what you meant. And never been in a place where you are almost outnumbered by black people. <laughs> okay, I understand. I say that with all love. I understand the discomfort, the uncertainty, and I say this with all seriousness, I say with all seriousness, that disruption hurts. 
it is frightening. It is, it is scary to share space with the other, especially when they come with their own traditions, with their own authority, with their own authority. I want to believe that a lot has changed in the 30 years ago when I first arrived here. And as I say it again, it was a great school. History and time and God sent me elsewhere. But what it means for us in this, this place right here, for white theological institutions have now had several generations of students of color to move to their halls. And indeed, most of the racial ethnic student faculty members of today were the minority students taught in many cases by a first generation of scholars like James Cone, Charles Long, Preston Williams, just to name a few that I remember who were not my instructors, but they were teaching at the time that I was a graduate, a student. Indeed, many black scholars, as Willie Jennings has pointed out, who were teaching in, uh, were teaching back then when I was in school, were actually were teaching at historically black theological institutions. But now that that first generation of scholars like Cone are passing off the scene, but so is that first generation of those of us who were taught by those scholars. Katie Cannon. So those of us who were students 30 years ago are becoming administrators and presidents and deans 30 years later. And what will it cost us as we move into these ranks of deans and presidents and senior academic administrators? The last few years has seen a rise in the number of people of color being tapped and stepping up to senior administrative leadership. Barbara Holmes, Marsha Foster Boyd, Stephen Ray, Emily Towns, and Brian Blunt, Stephanie Crowder, Yolanda Pierce, and Maisha Handy, though at black institutions. But this is not a moment of add black woman and stir. <laughs> this is not a moment of add purple and stir. We don't mix very well. This is not a moment of the institution continues the way it is. You just stir a black woman or a black man or a Latino or LGBTQIA and things will go on. It is a disruptive moment. And so what a prospective student of color will see as she or he visits Mathesco, it's no longer called Mathesco, MTSU, <laughs> will be very different from what they would have seen three decades ago, given the tectonic shifts in theological education and the dramatic pace of change in higher ed, which a dean must catch reins on. But we will see, I hope, a very serious work in progress. And so when and where we enter, all of our peeps Come with us. All of our traditions, all of our history, all of our idiosyncrasies, all of our visions come in here. But what does it cost the scholar of color? And what does it cost an institution to adapt to this new life together? Making an old house fit new occupants is exhausting and bruising work. It has been the case with minority scholars in predominantly white institutions. One of the untold stories of theological education in the last few decades has been the painful struggle of scholars of color trying to thrive in places like this. 
And as one scholar pointed out, and there is a trail of tears of minority faculty members, black women especially, that match a trail of missteps and bad steps and ugly steps by institutions. I wish I had known this. I wish I had known this maybe 15 years ago, maybe about 10 years ago when I stepped down and left and resigned from a tenured faculty position. I did not know, I did not have, I was not surrounded by, it was not possible to have a ceremony like this just 10 years ago, just 15 years ago. When I resigned my tenure post, I couldn't talk about why I left. It took years, and perhaps this is probably only the second time I have ever publicly talked about it. But I will say now, and I'm really ready to admit now, that I left because I was lonely. I resigned because it is isolating being the only one, the first one. And there is, how do you talk about being isolated and lonely when you are a tenured professor, a scholar? As my father said when he visited my office at Vanderbilt, so all they want you to do is read these books. <laughs> Hell, that's all they pay you to do. Uh, uh. How do you talk to a man who grew up in the segregated South and did not finish the eighth grade and wanted to be an engineer but became an abuser instead? How do you? Say him, say to him, I'm leaving because I'm lonely. The dogged sense of isolation, Valerie, the loneliness, the scrutiny, the comparisons, the attacks, the constantly having to prove oneself, the microaggressions. And so as Toni Morrison says, and she had nothing to fall back on. Not maleness, not whiteness, not ladyhood, not anything. And out of the profound desolation of her reality, she may very well have invented herself. Without maleness, nor whiteness, nor ladyhood to fall back on, I left Vanderbilt to invent myself. And you will have to learn how to invent yourself in this space, in this space. And so you may be asking yourselves, so Renita, what, what, did, what did God do with the title of the, you know, right? <laughs> what, you know. I, I haven't been away from the academy that long. I, I know what I'm supposed to be doing. But you know, where, where, where is, uh, is Brittany Cooper here? Yeah. Yes, but you know they ask you for the title. <laughs> and you're like, I don't know what I'm gonna talk about. <laughs> but they want paper <laughs> and they need a title. And God don't speak until the night before. But nevertheless, <laughs> but that's okay. But they want a title. We don't know what the title is supposed to be until we get there. That's how medicine women work. 
But I will say, I just, there, there is the title and then and there is what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> Let me say a few things about also why I came, not only to sub celebrate Valerie, but I call her in this context my friend Valerie, by her name Valerie, not only to thank MTSU, but the invitation allowed me to think more intentionally about a topic that occupies me at this age and stage, and that is about authority. Yeah. I am on a journey of probing and poking around at the whole notion of authority, the authority of the dean's office, constitutional authority, institutional authority, gendered authority, biblical authority, religious authority, authority given and authority taken away. The authority that comes with time, age, and reason. And so I, as I was preparing these few remarks, I remembered something that my friend Bell Hooks said to me many years ago when I asked her how she published so very many books. And she said, Renita, the difference between me and you all who are preachers and scholars she says, I travel around, and I teach as well, and I write as well. She says, but if you want to really publish, you've got to talk about what you're writing about, and you've got to write about what you're talking about. And you cannot make people or let people force you into talking about what you're not writing about. And so it is within this context by whose authority and the story of Huldah and the occasion of Valerie being installed, that while the title is lofty and ambitious, my interest is in women's authority. My interest and preoccupation over these 30 odd years in the academy and as a scholar has always been in the journey of a woman in finding her authority and claiming her authority. And so my interest in biographies of women in academic life, Jill Kerr Conway, Jane Thompson, Carolyn Heilbrunn, but nowhere is the point driven home more forcefully than in biographies, that the personal is political. And so, Valerie, you, for the seven years I served as an academic VP at a small little HBCU there in Nashville, it was better than the 18 years I was on the faculty. It was something about being on the other side of the desk. It was something about being now the one who must say no. And so I have been on the hunt for the biographies of black women in higher ed. And I would love to read a biography by and about Ruth Simmons, first black woman to be president of an Ivy League institution, Brown University, or even the, the biography of Dr. Janetta Cole, president, former president of Spelman College. Women of color, however, or however artificially vested in robes of power with the accompanying markers, degrees, publications, and academic rank, are often seen, nevertheless, as academic impostors. We're always being asked, in one way or another, says who? With all your vestments, and all of your degrees, and all of your education, says who? How dare you? By what authority do you claim to be the dean and the academic VP 
of this institution. How dare you think you can be the chief academic officer of MTSU? How dare you think you can help make and shape policies and procedures? How dare you have a voice to even, in fact, be the enforcer of shared governance? Who do you think you are? To be the one that I must come to to sign off on my grade being changed. How and what other people take for granted have no they have no idea the negotiations in the office of a black woman dean. That the power you must use and refrain <laughs> from using. How much Jesus they really think you have in you. <laughs> I don't think it is just a black woman's issue, but it is uniquely a black woman's issue. So this place, this place, and so instead of doing the academic lecture that I had thought, I just want to leave you with a couple of things here about what it means to be a woman at a certain age. Because for Renita to have come, and this is not about Renita, but it is one thing to hire a black woman when she is at the early stages of her career, when she is still being shaped and formed, and when she's still intimidated, and she has not yet found her voice, and she doesn't yet know the politics, and she doesn't even yet know who she really is. But it's another thing. It's another thing. I say it's another thing now. When you hire us, when we is fully grown. <laughs> fully grown. Hand, hands on your hip and let your backbone slip. It, it's another thing when you go to Hulda's house. And you have a question to ask Hulda. And she does not equivocate. She doesn't say, well, why are you asking me? Well, I don't know why you're thinking about me. And maybe you should see Jeremiah. And have you thought about Zephaniah? And how about Rebecca? Because after all, they are the real ones who belong to the Deuteronomistic school. And they are the authoritative voices. And they are the, they are the prophets. And they are the, they are the larger prophets, in fact. They, they are the major prophets, in fact. And, and, and they come from a long line of prophets. And, and they've, got, they've got the degrees on their walls. And, and, They've been conferred. It's, it's one thing when you go, but, but do you mean you come to me? Well, don't. she doesn't ask that question. She said, listen. <laughs> tell a man. <laughs> don't tell a man. She doesn't even say the king. She said, listen, tell that man <laughs> that I said. I know God said it, but listen. <laughs> As I tell people all the time, that's God says it on Sunday, but Renita says it on Friday. Amen. <laughs> tell that man who sent you that God don't like ugly. <laughs> tell that man who sent you that there is a God who sits high and looks low. Tell that man that sent you until you do right. Until you do right. By my mama and my mama's mama and my mama's mama's mama. We are so disruptive. <laughs> it takes, as Inti Shange's name says, she who comes with the walk of a lion. Yes. She who comes into the room with the walk of a lion. 
It is a disruptive moment, but this is a good moment in the history of this school. Disruptive, yes, because someone is in the room now who raises a different set of questions. Someone is in the room now who will hold a mirror up to you and, and perhaps force you to see a self that you have not wanted to see. It's a disruptive moment because MTSU is about, is in the midst of turning a corner. And if it is true as Phyllis Tickle says, this church that we find ourselves in, quoting a, a Bishop Dwyer actually in her book, The Emerging Church, that every 500 years, the church has a garage sale. <laughs> every 500. And we are in the midst of that 500 year mark where everything is out in the yard and is up for sale. And the whole church and the whole country, but the whole church is up for re-evaluation. And it is being turned upside down, and it does not yet appear what it will be like. The decline in enrollment, let's be honest, the decline in the church, the decline in offerings, and the decline in endowment, and the difficulty of, of, of finding teaching positions, and the, 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 the retirement of a particular, era, a particular group of faculty, and the uh, emergence of a new uh, 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 cohort of faculty, and the, the, the rise in the number of adjunct professors, and, and it looks like theological schools are, are, are dying in their own kind of way, and we always are chosen when it's dying. So we get a chance to now come to be the head of our institutions when they're in their last breath, when they're coughing, and we're asked to perform a miracle. That is, as black men, as people of color, I, but I would charge you, Valerie, and I would charge this school to give yourselves time to grieve. Valerie, some of the ugly things that you will face here in the middle of Ohio for such a time as this. Who knows why you have come to this place? Give the school and give your colleagues the opportunity to grieve. And grieving is not always linear and it's not always easy for them to watch their world change and for you to watch the world you too have been invested in change. I know that to be the case. And so to think that you are here in middle Ohio, Mid can we, middle Ohio. <laughs> Under this presidential administration, and I don't mean Jay Rundle's presidential <laughs> administration. He cool, he cool. <laughs> but that God would force some students who are going to go back to little small places in Ohio. And they who have never, you've got faculty who've never been taught by a black woman. They don't even know that that impacts how they interact with you. It was not just that I was lonely at Vanderbilt. It is that I was called into the office by my dean to tell me what white students were saying about me. And I could take what the white students were saying about me. It is my asking my dean, but what did you say? What did you say? I expect nothing better from them. But what did you say when they said what they said about me? And when 
he is as intimidated as they are. He will not speak up for you. And so you will find yourself, God has placed you in a place where you are working with students who will go back into red Ohio where they had never seen a black woman, not just a black woman, but a black woman as a vice president of academic affairs. They've never had to negotiate with one. They never had one to tell them no. They've never ever had one to walk in her own authority. Five foot generously. <laughs> With heels, yes, with heels on. Five foot generously that she is so short and so strong. Yes. Valerie, you're the right woman for the job. Yes. Who knows why you have come to the kingdom? By whose authority, Holder? By the authority of the one who called you to be a prophet and the one who says, write the vision and make it plain. By the authority, by whose authority, Valerie? By the authority of your mama and your grandmama and the ancestors. By the authority of uh, your mama, Bernice. Amen, somebody. And, and by the authority of your great grandmama and Mama White, did you say great mama, great grandmama White? By their authority, you are here for such a time as this. But not only that host of ancestors, but also including by the authority of Ella Pearson Mitchell, yeah. by the authority of Katie Cannon, yeah. by the authority of Prathia Hall Wynn, yeah. by the authority of Anna Julia Cooper, yeah. by the authority of Fanny Barrier Williams by the authority of Mary McLeod Bethune. Yeah. These all died in faith, yeah. not receiving what was promised. Yeah. All they could do was see it from afar, yeah. but they without us will not be perfect. Yeah. Put your hands together and give God some praise. Yeah. You the one, you the one. Now go be great, go be the woman God has called you to be. Come on and give God some praise for this telling. Come on and stand on your feet. Come on, Valerie. We thank God for you. We thank God. And your grandmama and your mama and them, and your daddy and them, all the preachers of your church are looking down on you right now. And by the authority vested in all of us, we give God praise and we give God honor for you. Now go be a woman of authority. There is a very strong word in the gospel that speaks and says to us, it's a word that gives authority. And it says that whatever you bind will be bound. And whatever you unbind will be unbound. And I think that speaks to this moment of prayer, of the prayers of the people. And let's not limit the binding and the unbinding to the little things. Let's go big on this one. Wozanom twa loa ko. Wozanom twa loa ko. Wozanom twa loa ko. O Jesus, a zosa ti ai woza, woza, 
Nomtualo wako Woza Nomtualo wako Woza Nomtualo wako Oh Jesus Azoza tia Bring your burdens Come Bring your burdens To Your burdens to God, your burdens to God, for Jesus will never say, bring your burdens to God, bring your burdens to God, bring your burdens to God. For Jesus will never say Woza, Woza, non twalo wako, Woza, non twalo wako, Woza, non twalo wako, Uyesega soza dia. Loving God, in whom we live, breathe, and have our being, we give thanks to you for your steadfast love and faithfulness through all generations. We acknowledge your grace and our sin. We confess that we have not been faithful disciples, nor have we been faithful stewards of your gifts, of your grace, of your creation. Forgive us. Hear our prayers as we bring our burdens to you. We present our concerns for the earth, for every river, every tree, for every fowl and every fish. Steady your creation, O oh God. Create in us a sense of urgency to put our hands to the task of shared care. Then tell us where to put our efforts. Forgive us the damage we have done. In your mercy, correct us and heal us and all creation. We pray for peoples in all lands and places. Especially, we pray for people made vulnerable through human greed and violence. Those made poor through predatory policies. Those made refugees through war and disease. Those wounded through intimate violence. Help us, your followers, to respond in ways that aid the vulnerable and change systems. We pray for your church, fractured and called to bear witness to your salvation. We confess our complicity in divisions. We have not always met your call to live together in faithful community. Forgive us. Help us to build unity in diversity, faithfulness in creativity, and to take bold, holy stances in your name. Help us to keep our eyes on the prize of your high calling. We pray now for all who are hurting and pause now for those secret prayers upon our hearts. Receive them. And now we pray together in the spirit of the first disciples, the words offered from our siblings in New Zealand. Father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven, the hallowing of your name echo through the universe. The way of your 
justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in glory and the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. stand. As chair of the board of trustees at the Methodist Theological School in Ohio, I welcome you to this role. Sharing in God's vision for this institution, we give thanks for what you bring to us. We give thanks for those who have loved you and formed you. We give thanks for the light you bring and the gifts that you're going to share with us. We give thanks for the seeds you will plant and the new dreams that will take root and grow. President Rundell, would you stand? I present to you Dr. Valerie Bridgman for installation as Dean and Vice President of Academic Affairs of Methodist Theological School in Ohio. Bridgman, do you affirm the MTSO mission to provide theological education and leadership in pursuit of a just, sustainable, and generative world? I do. Will you, as Dean and Vice President for Academic Affairs, endeavor to advance MTSO as a vibrant, diverse, inclusive community that faithfully engages the intersections of church, society, and academy to prepare leaders for ministry and service in pursuit of a transformed world. With God's help, I will. MTO, MTSO is deeply committed to transformative, sustaining justice as an expansive theological vision consistent with creative, renewing, resurrecting activity of God in the world. To this end, we create a new imagination for the church of the future through creative work in institutional programs, relationships, and resources 
to promote equity, justice, and integrity. We intentionally connect with social justice movements that attend to sustainable social change, transforming both church and world. Will you support us in this work, challenging us and holding us accountable when necessary? As God helps me, I will. Together with all gathered here and all those engaged in the mission of this institution, it is my honor to install you as Dean and Vice President for Academic Affairs of Methodist Theological School in Ohio. installation of the Reverend Dr. Valerie Bridgman as our academic dean. I am proud to bring the charge from the Board of Trustees. MTSO is a, has a revised mission and vision statement. The dean will need to continue to cultivate these and let them be used as guides in facing challenges, changes in our social world. In this time of transition, this is a unique time to utilize our mission and vision statements to retest their usefulness. MTSO is deeply committed to sustaining social justice. It is an intentional value in the legacy of MTSO. Throughout its history, speaking on behalf of all people remains a core value. To this end, we ask for the continued development in institutional programs and relationships that will promote equity, justice, and integrity. The board is an entity of policy makers, not micromanagers. The board would like to be informed and updated <laughs> development within the institution, having ongoing information will enable the board to make policy decisions based on information received. We view this as an open communication and partnership in ensuring the well-being of the school. Given the issues being faced by the United Methodist Church, a new period is unfolding that will impact MTSO. New challenges will create new opportunities. These challenges will not be easy. 
And we will look to the president and the dean to provide leadership as we find ourselves attempting to find our place in this era. The very nature of theological education may be questioned. Financial strategies will present themselves and will impact decision making. MEF, Methodist Education Fund, would need reevaluation. Changes in technology will force continual upgrades so that we enable the seminary community to be on the cutting edge of change. Students will benefit from such changes. We exist in a time of society changes. Changes create hostility, and dialogue may be harsh, and the dean will need to assist the community in finding ways to be in dialogue and navigate together in order to find ways for MTSO to proceed in its work. The dean is sometimes the face of the institution. Uh, from requests from the president, the dean may represent the president. Communication between the president and the dean is extremely important to provide representation and sharing data to the community. Walking this journey together in harmony is of utmost importance. The Reverend Dr. Valerie Bridgman is uniquely prepared to help navigate MTSO at this time. She brings experiences gained from previous positions and is aware of challenges through interactions in national and international speaking engagements. The president and Valerie recently led this school through site visits for reaccreditation. And we will learn the final outcome in early 2019. But from all indications, from all indications, these were good visits. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, we welcome Dr. Reverend Dr. Valerie Bridgman as the next academic dean for the Methodist Theological School in Ohio. What a historical moment this is. What a historical moment. a need prior to my charge to add an addendum to uh, Reverend Dr. Weems' comments about academic deans. Uh, there is a periodic resurrection <laughs> for old deans that happen on occasions such as this, <laughs> and it's an honor. <laughs> Reverend Dr. Dean Valerie Bridgman, welcome to the middle. Jesus. <laughs> You've been charged with being in the middle, between faculty and administration, between students and faculty, and between faculty when they fight. <laughs> Most profoundly, you are the embodiment of the seminary and its faculty's place in both the church and the academy each one offering opportunities and demanding allegiance. Your charge is to lead us in negotiating that dual relationship, resolving the tension by favoring one community over the other, 
is negligence of duty. We exist because we are bold. In your role as dean, you are bold. Pastor and scholar. Embrace it. Continue your own growth as a scholar as you help us do the same. Love the church. Help us attend to it. Now I add one more segment to this charge. In this case, it's really a plea. Keep us whole. We're fragile people who do our work and live our lives in fragile institutions. But we won't admit it. We, particularly faculty, are human beings who seem to think that the world revolves around us. <laughs> and it just isn't true. So help us create something in our brokenness and in the brokenness of the world around us within this very human institution help us find our strengths so that all who are associated with us might find theirs it is in the recognition of our fragility that the years of study the knowledge acquired and the experience gained by this faculty begins to speak into the lives of our students and the communities where they now and in the future will serve. Remind us and then lead us. Be now my wisdom and be my true word ever within me my soul is assured. I believe that MTSO sets itself apart when all of our work is an indication to each other, our students, and the world that MTSO is a place of action and not merely a place of words in an institutional document. Thank you and congratulations. Dr. V. Mm. Congratulations and blessings of Methodist Theological School in Ohio. On behalf of all MTSO students, past, present, and future, I implore you to continue. I implore you to continue speaking from your heart what you know to be true both about the world's ever-present injustices as well as the ever-present hope we are afforded in the divine source of all life. I implore you to continue challenging us to name our privilege, our biases, and our indifference so that we may more effectively build relationships of solidarity with the marginalized and the oppressed. I implore you to continue inspiring us to embody lives of justice-driven faith through your gifts of preaching and teaching in addition to fulfilling the many responsibilities that are required of you as dean of our seminary. I implore you to continue being present to students and alumni alike as we seek your sage counsel about how to lead lives of lasting significance, of meaning, 
and of purpose in our various vocations. I implore you to continue extending your gifts of effervescence and charisma in the worlds of academia, the church, and beyond, reminding us all the while that scholarship, ministry, and life need not be so boring. <laughs> I implore you to continue finding joy in what you do because it is infectious, encouraging us to find and spread divine joy in our own vocations as well. I implore you to continue caring for yourself as you immerse yourself in your multifaceted and grueling work, because in so doing, you promote the non-negotiable practice of self-care for students past and present alike. Lastly, I implore you to receive the truth that you are and will continue to be deeply respected and loved by your students, in part because of all that you do, but mostly because of all that you are. On behalf of all MTSO students, past, present, and future, I give thanks for your life, for your ministry, and for your leadership. We love you. Riches I need not nor lives empty praise you my inheritance now and always you are you only are first in my heart great God my treasure Valerie, that you are of, from, and for the church is undeniable. The decades that you spent being nurtured by its liturgies, sermons, and hymns, the years you spent preaching and teaching, pastoring and prophesying, writing poetry and making art, the semesters of preparing its ministers and congregants to read and proclaim sacred texts with the knowledge that God is greater and people are beloved. The many, many days you've wakened with prayers for the people and before breakfast for the pastors who shepherd them. All of these demonstrate your abiding love for the church and beloved community. We, having been your pastors, have great confidence in your commitment to the people who gather locally, denominationally, and ecumenically, a commitment that extends to all of creation. And we know that you will continue to be a blessing to the church, and so we bless you. These blessings are excerpts from a litany written by Reverend Anna Blydell. We bless you to bless those who are raging. We bless you to bless those who are mourning. We bless you to bless those who feel sick and tired and sick and tired. We bless you to bless those who've been organizing. We bless you to bless those who have been testifying. We bless you to bless those who have been hearing. We bless you to bless those who have been resisting. We bless you to bless those who are working hotlines and crisis care centers and bearing witness to the faces of violence and trauma unleashed and unloosened. We bless you to bless those who dream of a world without sexual violence, white supremacy, misogyny, police brutality, anti-trans and anti-queer violence. We bless you to bless those who labor together 
to make it so. Amen. I invite you to stand for the closing stanza. Sovereign of heaven, my victory. can't take some folks everywhere. You can dress them up in their robes and make them look all official, and they're still going to bring their gullah stick. Yeah. I can't hide things from the medicine woman. She called me just before we left and said, I saw you with this stick. And so here we are to continue the blessings. You have been duly installed as vice president of academic affairs and dean, and I hold this stick in my hand to continue to open the space for your blessing. Not an ordinary stick, but from the people from the rice coast of Africa, Sierra Leone, Senegal, and when they were stolen and taken and marooned on the islands of South Carolina and Georgia, and the captors took their drums, they clapped their hands, they stomped their feet, and they picked up sticks. They did it to create sacred space, to tune broken hearts, to stitch communities together. This morning we bless in three ways, with music, with symbolic gifts, and with prayers. First, the blessing with music. We bless with music because the West African proverb says, where there is no music, the spirit will not come. So I call on the Reverend C.L. Johnson to invoke the blessing. calling your name. We bless you because you are a truth teller in an age of lies and liars. We bless, we bless you because you do not hide your tears, nor do you use your tears to manipulate others. Finally, we bless you because you lead with your spirit as well as your intellect. The second blessing is gifting. I have chosen symbolic gifts that represent the constituencies of your community committed to your success. Let these gifts that we offer today remind you that on this day we lifted you, we supported you, but more importantly, we agreed to follow your leadership as you follow your president and your board of trustees. I've chosen on behalf of the board a gift of the Egyptian 
cross. The Ankh is a sign of eternal life, power and resurrection that flows from the divine. The Coptic Church adopted this cross as a sign of resurrection through Jesus Christ. Let this gift bless you with God's ongoing renewal and resurrecting power. Would board members please, please rise and say after me, we bless you, we bless your work. of the faculty, the symbolic gift of a lotus incense burner. In the Buddhist tradition, the lotus represents spiritual awakening and perseverance. Because the lotus grows in water that is mucky and full of mire, <laughs> but rises above it all to bloom as one of the most beautiful flowers on earth. You may place this on your altar. Will the faculty please stand and say, we bless you. We bless your work. On behalf of the student body, I have chosen the symbolic gift of pillowcases imprinted with the sign of the Native American medicine wheel also known as a sacred hoop, used by Native Americans as a sign of health and healing mercies. We know that you will work tirelessly on behalf of your students. Let this gift be a reminder to rest. Will the students please rise and say, we bless you. We bless, we bless your work. And finally, we offer the stick on behalf of the ancestors. <laughs> Leaning over heaven's balcony to view this moment, and on behalf of womanists gathered in body and in spirit, reminding you that you can hit a straight lick with a crooked stick. <laughs> Dean Bridgman, my mother called you daughter. I call you sister. This community calls you Dean. The blessings have been offered. Now do the work with great joy. Do not be afraid of their faces. Having put to your hand to the plow, do not turn back. We love you. Asher. Thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. Oh,
very much aware of the time and that you're hungry. I know it is always dangerous to start thanking people, but I'm going to try it anyway. You can read in the program the people whose names are already to be thanked and do read them. I am deeply thankful for them. But I want to talk about a couple of things. This altar, which is a deep representation of my heritage as a woman of African descent, as a woman of faith, and as a woman of fierce justice activity. It bears the pictures of my ancestors. This is my mother, Bernice O'Neill McKinney Bridgman. If you parse it out, you'll see that it is the bomb. She was always that. She is at the very root of some of my fierceness. But her fierceness comes from Grand Graham. Callie Pearson McKinney, who if you look very closely, you can see her native features as much as her African features. She is the medicine woman who taught me what it meant to be a medicine woman, a healer and an intercessor. This is Robert, boy baby Bridgman. <laughs> He is the first person to notice the call of God on my life. He was in Cleveland, Ohio. He came back. I was wrestling with God. I said, Renita, when God called me, that I was too young, too black, and too female. And Jeremiah 1 was the call text, as it is for so many other people, say not I am a child. And my father called Cleveland Euclid Avenue Church of God, the Anderson tradition, and told the saints, pray for my daughter. She's in a wrestle for her life. And who knows if she will say yes to God. I have been saying yes ever since. Behind him is my grandmother, his mother, Louise Joan. Grandma Louise, she was a sharecropper in central Alabama, real town, lived on the land of the people that owned her people until she died. I was going to say raised, I don't remember how many children, but she raised hers and her children's children, as black grandmothers are wont to do. She taught me how to cuss. She and Aunt Lena, and I promise you, it comes in handy every now and then. Because as I told somebody I was going to say today, these are cussing times. These are the immediate ancestors who strengthened and called forth my tongue, my vocation, my call. I am grateful for them, for the great cloud of witnesses that bring me forth call me forth day by day, the saints that prayed for me, the saints who pray for me still. I am the result of a thousand loves and a million prayers. To God be the glory. For this day, I want to recognize just a couple of other people whose names are not in the program, but whose work is very evident in this place. Jorge's name is in the program, but y'all, this altar, that Jorge Lacqua, my boy, <laughs> my friend, I mean, we'd have been through some stuff together, and he saw me, and he sees me, he knows me. He, with the help of Valerie Boyer, put together this altar. I just... They use pieces out of my life, and I want to especially mention this quilt. It is the quilt that the Zuri Quilting Guild in Nashville, Tennessee, of which Renita Weems is one, made for those of us who were, were named Womanist Legends in 2012. 
when they called me and said, you're going to be named the legend, I was like, I ain't been alive long enough to be nobody's legend. <laughs> but I take the challenge that the quilt, that I be the legend that the quilt tells me I am. My, my mentors, three of my biggest mentors, you've already seen them. And I just want to say, I couldn't imagine this day without you, Renita, and without you, Barbara, and without you, Frank. I just couldn't imagine it. I couldn't imagine this day without you. And so I had to give up Kurt Whalum for jazz <laughs> in order to get Renita Weems, because <laughs> they couldn't be here at the same time. I was like, love you, Kirk. We'll find another time. <laughs> True story. Y'all think I'm joking. True story. <laughs> True story. Jennifer uh, Fowler read the scripture. She like read the scripture. <laughs> but Jennifer, about a couple of weeks ago, stepped in and said, what can I do to help? And just went to work. She did that. As Lee Precise in the president's office, I can't even tell you the way Lee helped. And there are just so many ways to talk about Lee Precise. And I'm just telling you, if you see her, don't hug her without her permission, but tell her thank you for me. <laughs> Susan Zimmerman, who is the events coordinator, the attention to detail she gave, the way she moved in and out of black folk doing what black folk do. And, and, and she was like, I get it, it's cultural. <laughs> yeah. I told her some of y'all was going to be here that didn't register. She was like, okay. <laughs> and here you are. <laughs> Woosah. <laughs> Danny Russell for the program that is so well done and the way he exposed this event for his playing on the organ after he was like, what? Uh, but yes, for Chef James, who you haven't yet tasted, but let me just tell you, Chef James about to bless your whole life. <laughs> he and that entire staff in the dining hall that is locally sourced, some of the food grown on this farm at Seminary Hill, Seminary Hill Farm. Tad Peterson, who was the staff person that bled, is our chief farmer who and director of food and just an amazing person, just stellar work and I am so thankful for them. The unofficial crew of, of uh, Jennifer with her type A administrative get it done stuff to the newly minted PhD in religious history, yes I had to say it, Dr. Tajay Bueller. <laughs> For all her field the pockets were, for all the drivers, Kyle Brooks, Gwen, Tom, I don't know who all drove, so if y'all drove, wave, wave your hand. Yes, that crew, yes. Uh, just all of you who have put your hand to this work, I know I left somebody out, but it was not intentional. And lastly, I just want to say my siblings are here. Um, except for my oldest brother, Wayne Matton, and I do want you to see my siblings, and when they stand up, and I am counting my brother Antonio, uh, and when my siblings stand up, I just want to say there are no triplets or quadruplets in this, in this picture. So of my siblings, my sisters, uh, this... So... So the, the lady in red is my sister, Deborah Johnson. This is my older sister, Pamela Bridgman. This is my sister, Gwen Thomas, that you know. Antonio, the reason I had to make him stand up is because he is not the son of either of our parents, but he is my brother. Like, no, for real. You know how we say, oh, that's your play brother. No, 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 no. Ain't no play about it. That's my brother. And, and of course, all of my friends who have come from all over, I can't make all of y'all stand up, but... I'm just, I can't even tell you how happy I am to see y'all. I mean, like, I'm in my happy place. <laughs> thank, 
thank you so much. I take seriously the charges that have been made to me this day. I take seriously the faith you have put into me as faculty, as staff, as administrators, as the board, as the larger community. My OSU folk, raise your hand at us, just wave at us. Yes, OSU is in the house. And uh, just the faith that you are putting in me, I, I commit to you that even when I fail, because I will, it's called being human, I will always be trying to live up to what you've called me to.
Say. 